Welcome to Closer to Venus. I am Johnny Burke, and today's guest is Adi Kanda. She is an intuitive author and founder of The World Without Fear Community. Adi receives vibrationally active transmissions in written form and offers cellular level attunements via detailed past life readings. Today, we will be discussing the meaning found within karmic uh, transpersonal healing. Adi, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Johnny. Excellent. Now, you seem to have many different intuitive skills. One thing looks like perhaps automatic transmission, or, or should I say automatic writing, and also past lives. What came to the surface first for you? It was receiving through written word. I describe it as an intuitive awakening because it was spontaneous. It was not something cultivated or expected in any way. I do um, want to honor some work that I had done previous to that awakening, which is a body of work called Master Alignment, and I had received an attunement in that body of work in 1998. And then in January of 2000, I was keeping a dream journal. I was studying Jung at the time, and I was keeping a dream journal literally right beside my pillow. I found if I you know, if I even got up to pee, I'd forget half the dream. And I really wanted to remember all of it. So I had the journal and the pen right there. And I woke up one morning and there were pages of really exquisite poetry in the journal that I had no memory of writing at all. Interesting. It was not necessarily a happy experience for me. I was uh, shocked and I'd never had any experience like it. And I, I have to admit, I actually felt a little violated. And I felt like someone had come into my bedroom and put something in my book, you know, my private space. Um, so I called a very dear friend of mine who's since passed, but she was I, you know, kind of my feminine soulmate. Um, we were very close. And so I felt comfortable sharing with her. She got really excited and said, oh, this is amazing. This sounds like something's coming through you. And I thought, well, easy for you to say. It didn't come through you. <laughs> and so she said, well, let's try an experiment. Let's see if you can do it again. And she said, let's see if we can tell where it's coming from by I'll ask a question. And you see if you can hold that question and get an answer for me, and then we'll know it's guidance. And I said, well, you know, I know everything about you. And she said, actually, you don't. So she said, I'll ask a question that has to do with something that you actually don't know. We've been friends for 15 years, so I was a bit surprised by that. But um, so she asked a question. The next night it repeated, and this time it was very specifically for her. I, I had trouble reading my handwriting because it was in the dark. My, I was writing over top of my own writing, and that troubled me at first. But I found when I relaxed my own resistance to the process, I could see what was there. And I have a very vivid memory of that day being on the phone and reading to her what I had received, because it didn't make sense to me. It was beautiful words, but I didn't understand it. And she just started to sob on the phone. And I said, what, what? Uh, and she said, well, you know, not only did you answer my question, but you've just shown me that I'm not alone because you didn't know anything about this. So if you can now tell me this, it means I'm seen. It means I'm heard. It means I'm understood. Wow. That's really, really amazing. Is it possible that your dream journal actually triggered or initiated your intuitive path? Is that possible? The way I look at it is more that I was in between dream and waking state. And in that space, I think all you know, artists, musicians, those who bring through sacred writings understand that state. And it is a state of openness that bypasses the conscious mind and I think that was really what was important also I'm a writer so that is my way of expression I've been a writer since I was three years old uh, I began writing poetry at three and so it, I think source comes to us often in a way that is a match for us and that is something it's a, a door we can open and for me that was the written word okay now when you were young because obviously you've been writing since you were three which is Usually children don't start writing until they're like six or seven. Did you have any instances of psychic phenomena or seeing spirits, anything like that when you were young? I would describe my childhood as one of, of getting used to embodiment. I was um, a very, very sensitive child and found 
simply being a human, a foreign experience. That's my predominant memory of my childhood. I did spend time out of my body. I do remember sitting in the tree outside my bedroom window. I had um, powerful dreams, including a recurring nightmare that I had for about 10 years, almost every single night, that I think was an embodiment nightmare of like Alice in Wonderland shrinking down to a tiny, tiny, tiny spot and then expanding into a massive size and then it all recurring over and over again. I think what was more interesting in my childhood is that my mother had a powerful prophetic dream that I was going to be injured at a, um, I was a cheerleader, I was 12, going to a, to a football game, just a local little community game and she didn't want me to go because she had a dream that I was seriously injured and I was wearing red and my cheerleading uniform was red and she and my grandmother both tried to, they literally stood in front of the door trying to block me to say you can't go to the game your mother had a dream and I was 12 and I said I'm not staying home because my mother had a dream and and so I left and she sent my father to tail me without my knowledge and he sat in the stands and watched me have a terrible fall and break both of my arms um very badly at the same time so I'd say that um the tendency toward that openness uh, is something that ran in my soul family. In the bloodline. Okay, you just mentioned soul family. Does that have anything to do with uh, the past lives and perhaps a life between life space, or is that a different descriptor? The way I think of soul family, and I, I, I have to say that my understanding, I speak from what I know. My degrees in English literature, philosophy, I have a background in theater and writing. I'm not an academic. I'm not studied in, in esoteric realms necessarily. I absorb what I receive. And from, from that place, um, I would say that, that the experience of being in between lives is one that varies from individual to individual. And our transitioning and our experience of transitioning has as much to do with our karmic journey as our waking, uh, as our living days do. And so that can vary a lot. That archetypal patterning is not something we, c- we fully leave behind, that we can bring with us and do bring with us lifetime after lifetime. And so it can play out in between worlds to the degree that it is my belief that to some extent we generate our experience in between worlds in the same way that we generate our lives. And we will get to that, no doubt. Let's go back to the, I think it's automatic writing. The first thing that comes to mind is, um, and you might want to check this out, a woman named Gates McKibben did an episode uh, on the show a while back, and she described uh, her experience very similar to yours, and she basically called herself a scribe for spirit. It might be slightly different because you don't remember writing these accounts, these... Well, that first one, I didn't. And I I now receive in a much more present state than in the early days, because I've I've received thousands and thousands of transmissions over 25 years. So I am now able to access much more readily. But it came to me in that way, spontaneously, yes. Is that automatic writing or is it something else? What is it, actually? I mean, as I understand automatic writing, that is simply a way to bypass, again, the conscious mind and to open to interdimensional experience. So I'm not opposed to that word. I generally, I refer to the writings as transmissions. I refer to my process as receiving. I now receive in spoken word as well. I also um, bring through um, energy healings and attunements as well. So I feel it is one stream of energy. It's just finding its way to express through me. Right. And some people might call it channeling. Some people might call it something else. It, it's, it's a source you're tapping into, it sounds like. Mm-hmm. I think the distinction I observe between what I do and channeling is that, and, and of course, there's all gradations of that as well. But for example, there's a, a wonderful gentleman who lives not far from me here in Toronto, and uh, he's a trans channeler. So if you have a reading with him, he literally disappears. He falls asleep. He begins to snore. He's lying back in a lazy boy. And then he suddenly wakes up and he's a completely transformed human being with a different accent, a different presence. That is not me. I am still present, 
certainly now I'm very present. I am aware. So, for example, when I do past life readings, I am speaking what I am being shown. And to some extent, it's almost like I'm watching a movie and I can I'm describing. So if you were to say, oh, you know, what's that new film like? And I would tell you, oh, it's a great film. It looks like this. And I would tell you it's literally I am seeing a lot of visuals and at times I'm also being given very specific language or um, even phonetic words, because sometimes there are words that are not in my vocabulary or my knowledge, and those will be given to me phonetically. Would those experiences qualify as both clairaudient and clairvoyant or not necessarily? Yes, I would think so, I, because I also receive music as well. I went through quite a period of time where I received Num- dozens and dozens of uh, musical transmissions and they would come with language with word with uh, rhythm and with melody and with harmony often layers and layers so i my closest associate that i found going through history is hildegard von bingen i strongly identify with her experience i don't know if you're familiar with her but you did ask me about that before I'll have to put that in the notes for people that might want to reference that and look uh, look into that. So these transmissions, do you have any clue other than an attribution to source? Do you have an idea who is giving you this information or what is giving you this information? That's a really good question. And it's one I'm asked quite, quite often, in particular by clients. And it's an interesting thing because uh, I know very often, so, you know, Esther Hicks identifies Abraham as a, you know, a particular body of uh, spirit presence that comes to her. For some reason, I am not particularly curious. I don't feel a need to identify. If someone asks, I will. And I find that that varies a lot. So occasionally, a guide will make themselves known. But more often than not, for me, it is a state of absolute presence with, again, a stream, a direct stream of energy. And I, I did have a um, soul recovery um, for myself with a shaman once. And um, th- th- this particular experience was one of where we lay on the ground. There's the drumming and then we lay and we, her hand was on mine. And we both had our visions and then we shared them after the experience. And both of us saw the exact same thing, which was... Um, a fan of beings, like fanning out behind me, going off over the horizon into infinity of hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of all different kinds of beings, you know, including animal beings and plant beings. And so I feel I draw from that place and it really depends upon the need and the moment. Now, those beings that you just referred to, I think you also mentioned guide. Do you think those beings were spirit guides? Because I've been told that spirit guides can be human in form and many of them are animal spirit guides. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And I mean, uh, as I said, I have had, so there was one particular body of work in terms of a group of transmissions, which I'm very fond, which came to me in a a very special way, which was, um, I was invited to offer support to a family uh, with a little girl who'd been abducted. And they were obviously, as you can imagine, they were looking probably um, for um, Sylvia Brown. You know, they were looking for someone who could say, this is what's happened and this is where she is and we can find her. I am not a psychic and that is not my work. My work is, is of the soul path and the soul journey. But I was able to bring through information that was very meaningful to them. And they immediately recognized her and they recognized her communications. And so I spent about a month and a half with her family uh, until her body was finally found. Uh, And it was a really life-changing experience for me because of my own patterning, which is something we can get into later if you wish. But so... I asked for a name in, in honoring the privacy of her parents. I asked for her to give me a name to call her. And she said, call me Una. And then I, I, I shared that with her parents and her mom said, oh, that's my sister's name, her favorite aunt. She loves, she, she adores her. So, but these transmissions from Una are very specific to her. And I can recognize that Una transmission stands out very distinctly from the others. And primarily the transmissions I'm speaking to are actually ones that took place after her transition. 
because they change dramatically as, as I've done many transmissions from the deceased. And this is one thing we see is that universally, while we do continue our karmic journey and we do bring our stuff with us to some degree, we are immediately released from the bondage of our human blindness. And so there is a higher nature that comes through in these transmissions. It's very beautiful. And for Una, it was her last lifetime. And she shared this, uh, and she was a very unusual child. Her, her family was, uh, they were atheist, an Asian family atheists. And, uh, but she had a picture of Christ on one wall and Buddha on the other. And she had her own rituals and prayers that she did uh, yeah, just of her own accord. So um, it makes sense to me that, that uh, this was a last lifetime for her. That's a whole story around that. Right. Interesting. Interesting. So how did she know? It was her last lifetime, because that's not the first time I've heard that either. Uh, well, she told me specifically in in the trans, transmissions that came after her passing that the day of her, like, she did not die immediately. She was abducted and she died. She, did, she was alive for a period of time and, and, until her passing. And on the day I was receiving from her daily to share with her parents and on the day of her passing, I, I sat to receive from her as I always did. And she appeared in a lotus posture and she was actually levitating. She was hovering in midair and she just said, I've ascended. And I said, no, you got to give me more than that. Your parents are waiting, you know? And she just said, I have ascended. I have ascended. I have ascended. And that's all she would say. And then later she communicated, she was in process at that time and not open to communicating. And later she shared that she had specifically chosen the experience that she did in order to complete her journey, which I think is very important when we talk in these realms, you know, when we're so fascinated by transpersonal experiences, to me, what's so important is the why, like what is the meaning within, you know, even these experiences that we don't understand. So she was very clear about that. Now, do you still get transmissions from her? I can, if I ask, I haven't in a while. Can you ask her if this is my last lifetime? I hope it is. I want. I don't want to come back here. I want to go to oh, a planet Johnny. with su- with supermodels and hanging out with David Bowie and Prince. And I'm not coming back to this third dimension hellhole. Just kidding. Well, actually, I'm not kidding. But that's probably a story for another day. It's actually a really good point, though. If I if I may. I can answer your question because this has been spoken to in a number of the transmissions and you're not going to like the answer. And the answer is that when we are still in a place of saying, I want to leave, get me out of here, we are not done. That when we reach a point of absolute presence and surrender to all that is, then we may be ready in any moment. So no planet Zadar on the in the immediate future, I guess. All right, that's that's fine. Well, that would but, be up to you. <laughs> now, before I forget, you mentioned that you have made contact with several people that have transitioned. That sounds like something a medium would do, but at the same time, I think you're avoiding the label or positioning yourself as a medium. Is that true? That is correct. I have had experiences of mediumship, and I don't enjoy them. It's spontaneous. I I heard one of your other guests reference this who does past life readings that sometimes someone will show up if it's very important. And if it's very important, I will. In other words, what I think of as mediumship is an actual presence coming into me, inhabiting me and speaking through me. I prefer to keep my own field for myself, so I don't enjoy that sense of it. But if we were to, for example, say mediumship is simply the the process of of receiving a communication, then I guess that you could use that word. I also simply refer to them as transmissions from the deceased or letters from the deceased. And part of that is because while they come in the voice of the individual, and I've been told this over and over again, they will use words that that individual used, phrasing, languaging. For example, I just shared on my social media today a, a transmission I'd received from George Floyd Um, This is the third anniversary of his passing a few weeks ago, and I received it a few weeks after he transitioned. And so um, you can tell that languaging is not mine. It's his languaging. But it is also, there is a flavor, again, of 
the, the journey of the soul. So it's, there's nothing random about it. It's not just chit-chat. It is a very deep, high-frequency communication from the higher nature of this individual, very often expressing something they may not have been anywhere near capable of expressing in this life. So it's very different work from the work of some of the other, you know, like the Hollywood psychics and so forth that will just, you know, that they're all about the identifying facts, which is amazing to me, but my my work is quite different from that. So do you think that, you know, being able to contact people that have that have um, passed over, transitioned, does it give your clients some comfort knowing that once we die in this lifetime, it's not over, we keep coming back until we've done our work? Do you think that brings them comfort? Oh, absolutely. I think I, transmissions from the deceased and their own past life stories bring that element because you know, especially, I, I love it most of all when a client, and I don't know that the individual at all, they're brand new to me, and that's the joy of it. They may st- want to start telling me their story, and I'll say, no, don't, because you're going to enjoy this much more if you know that I know nothing. And then they're going to see that this isn't me. This is this is something, a much larger purpose and vision. And I think, Johnny, part of that depends upon our worldview, right? And I, I, where we're going to, where we come from in our in our worldview. And to me, the understanding that this dimension is purposefully dualistic is really important. So that our suffering is not random. There's nothing random about it or unintentional about it. Even the most difficult, difficult things. And that's not easy to digest, but I believe it is so. And And that we are not here to eliminate duality. We are here to alchemically transform our relationship to it. And that's a very different thing. I don't believe that this earth is a place that will ever be without dualistic references because that's our gift. That's our catalyst. Right. And that's how we learn from the obstacles. And I I was just talking with someone an hour ago about this where the people that trigger you or the things that trigger you, that's a sign that that is something you need to work on, not avoid it. Exactly. Bingo. We go into it. We go toward it. Yeah, that's, uh, well, it's something that that I've heard quite a few times. And one of my speakers came up with a brilliant quote. She said, if you're interested in this world, she's, she's a medium, this one particular woman, you have to basically unlearn almost everything you've been taught it's pretty scary if you think about it, but another way to look at it would be to remember what we have always known. I think that is also true. Past life readings and past life regression are not necessarily the same thing, are they? They're not at all the same thing in my experience. That's absolutely true. Past life regression, the individual um, is brought into a trance state of their own, and they are they are calling forward memories. Uh, for my work, it's called the core process, core with a K. It is, um, I am bringing through the reading and the lifetime, and it's recorded so that the individual has that as a tool to work with. And for me, it's actually, it's called the core process because it is a process. It's the pillar of a process of and a body of healing work that that unfolds over a matter of months or years. Okay. Now, in these readings with the past lives, I believe you mentioned earlier that you can view them almost as if you're viewing a movie. Is it very much the same thing with the the sitter, the client, or is it maybe a little bit different? It's extremely variable. It will depend upon the patterning of the recipient, where they are in their journey, their receptivity, their degree of anxiety in that moment. So the more open an individual is, the easier my process is. And I will share this with someone as we begin, that if they can put aside whatever is in the way in this moment, it will really assist the process. The most common thing I hear from folks immediately after one of these readings is you just told me my whole life. The stories that are given to me, the past life stories, the, the, the life, the lives that are chosen are lives that are very purposefully relational to where we are right now. So it's a life that is available to us as a template to be laid over top of our present moment experience, kind of a 
a user's manual um, that 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 opens the door to making sense of everything that we are experiencing now, knowing that these central, these core central patterns we have lived over and over and over again. I've heard that many times. The lives that come up are the ones that are typically relevant to what is going on right now in this one. It's in service of our consciousness. Okay. Now, um, in these sessions, have you traversed into the, what is called the in-between or the life in between life space with either you and or your clients? Only in so much as they may be guided about that particular lifetime. So it may be, they may have um, information given that, for example, their, their death was traumatic. Uh, in, in these particular readings that I offer, there is almost always a death. And the reason for that is, is that is, you know, that's a, it's a primary fear. It's a survival level fear. And it's when we do transition, we often imprint things that we can take with us. And so in that experience, if that death was highly traumatic, for example, or if there is a, a guilt patterning or a patterning of, of attachment of some kind, then that individual might hear that that transition was not easy for them and that they were not able to leave, for example, the scene of their death for several weeks, or that they had a particular process to go through. Um, there was one story that came to mind of a man who was um, hung uh, during the uh, witch trials in, in England. And as he was hung, he, he experienced a separation, a sort of a split uh, in his energy body. And so a part of him ascended and a part of him was stuck. So that kind of information uh, is given as it is relative to where we are now. So for him, you know, he's being shown an opportunity to, to work with this part of him that lives with a division within him, you know, part of him that knows his wisdom and his higher nature and a part of him that's very much entwined with the trauma. Okay. In these instances, in these readings, rather, have you come across any souls or beings that did not cross over and that are kind of stuck here? No, I can't say. I have, there was only one that I would say that came to mind, and it, but it was, um, how to describe it, it was a very unusual reading. It was a very difficult reading. It was not easy for the individual to receive. It was unlike any of the others, so... But I would say that the vast, vast majority... No, the other thing, Johnny, is the kind of individual who is seeking this kind of information, right? Someone who comes to me, and particularly the core work, because it's not, it's not entertainment. There's an attunement that comes along with these readings, and that attunement uh, initiates a cleansing of, the primary, of that primary fear-based pattern. And so it initiates a journey, a cleansing that is really, it's comparable to plant medicine in its intensity. So thus the individuals who are called to this work and who tend to say yes are individuals who are very dedicated and already have done quite a bit of work and there's a certain fluidity in their process. I don't know if that applies, but... I think it does. Now, you mentioned core and core stories how are the core stories related to the past lives that your clients had, or is it not necessarily relate, related? Oh, I, I use that term to describe the story given in the reading. So the reading t is, is me telling a story, you know, there was a little child and this child was you and they were standing on a ship and it was during this era and they were wearing such and such and this had just happened to them. That is their story. That is their core story. Got it. Okay. Yeah, cool. All right. So with these readings, I, I always ask this, what's the farthest back in time that you uh, and your client has had a past life? It's not uncommon to have um, very primitive tribal cultures, which is interesting to me. Um, and I've done one reading, which certainly seemed Atlantean. I've done one that was definitely an extraterrestrial experience. That was very unusual and difficult. That's uh, the one I referenced before. But I find most of them are given... So the, I'm really blessed. The guides I work with are very kind. They're very loving. And they know to whom they are speaking. So they tend 
to 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 give a story that is accessible to an individual so that they can see themselves in it because this is the the purpose of it but i think the reason that it's common to get primitive tribal cultures is that we're really being shown the beginning of when this patterning how it began to play out in a fairly simple way and and a lot of it also frequently pre industrial revolution because the more we get entangled with machines <laughs> the more distanced we become from these really primal elements of spirit so i think perhaps that's also why now let's talk about the organization you started world without fear what inspired the name to me it is um um a vision it holds a vision of the um the purposeful nature of the body of work as a whole and uh, I would say that if there's one theme that spans all of the thousands and thousands of transmissions of all different kinds and past life stories that I've received, it is that it's not as complicated. It's not nearly as complicated as we make it. And if we are willing to recognize that we can either hold a frequency of love or we can hold a frequency of fear, and that we do have a choice in this matter and that we in our human world i mean we go beyond in beyond into absolute oneness we're beyond choice but in three dimensions it's all about choice in the three dimensional world it's all about choice and that the gold <laughs> i don't know who said it first everything we've ever wanted lives on the other side of our fear you hear that phrase right that's a good one i like that that's it right there and so the thing is the ego, as I see it, I don't see the ego as a bad guy at all. I see ego as just a name we've given to an expression of our fear. And so through ego, we've learned to survive. We have needed it for our survival. We've learned how to protect ourselves, how to put on our armor of various kinds. So our journey, once we reach this level where we're having this kind of conversation and we're really, we're, we're ready to unpack, we're ready to know, to remember, then we are, we are ready to begin looking at the fear that we put away a long, long time ago. And we put it under the floorboards. We nailed it down. We put a carpet on top. We did not want to know it was there. So my work through these core readings is to assist individuals in pulling back the curtain on these things that are so difficult for us to see in ourselves. We really need to work in collaboration with others. And that's why we also do groups with this modality because we can see it in, we can see in others what we can't see in ourselves so much. I'm sure you've experienced that. Yeah, very true. So in other words, it sounds like processing the fear brings us closer to love with, which, you know, when, with all these different people that I've talked to about this seems to be like the common denominator, which is where we want to be, right? It's, it's a frequency. I think that, I know that was a, when I, when I really sort of came to understand what that meant, I always thought of love as action or emotion. And certainly that it, as a frequency, it can express through action and emotion, but it is a state of being. And the only thing that is in the way of that is our fear and our fear of our fear, even more so. So we can actually witness our fear and take its power away, even as it still exists, so long as we're not afraid of it. And, 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 and I think that is the work that's really exciting and very visceral and helps us understand the patterns, the archetypal patterns that may have driven us as long our whole life. Well, they will have driven us our whole life long. So, and imagine a world with populated by beings who are no longer afraid of their fear and are willing to take responsibility to own who they are and their actions and to, uh, and to release their attachment to these fear-based actions and patterning. And that's, that's the world I'm envisioning. It sounds like a great world indeed. Hopefully we get there. I don't know if it's going to be in this lifetime, but definitely something to aspire to. Anything else that we should know on this topic? I would say the overarching word to assist us in this process is, is trust with an uppercase T. And when we reach a point in our journey where we're able to stand in trust 
of even our most difficult experiences, especially our most difficult experiences, and we're ready to walk toward them, knowing they are the illusory gift of our karmic pattern, patterning, then everything changes. Absolutely everything changes. And we never look back. The world never looks the same again. We're never without tools, no matter how dark it gets. And uh, no matter how strong the oppositional energies are on the planet, and they're very, very strong right now, very, very heightened, because the collective consciousness is cleansing that which has been unseen, that which is under the floorboards. It's all being brought up. So to be in trust of the entire picture is, is so valuable. So the, the collective consciousness does seem to be trending upward. Absolutely. It's, it's challenging because, because of our patterns, we tend to attach to or be drawn to what we see as dark, as shadow, as fear. But the con- consciousness, I believe, has never been higher on the planet. And the dark is fighting for its life. That's why it's so vocal and so vivid. But doesn't, because of the duality, don't we need the dark in order to, to see the light? Um, without the dark, we wouldn't have anything to get any contrast, any context, rather, right? It's absolutely so. That is absolutely so. And there will always be contrast. So, for example, death. We're all afraid of death. Most of us, the vast majority of us, are afraid of death. And that is, I believe, why we have it. You know, we hot, cold, young, old, health, disease, every contrast we experience uh, uh, holds a gift within it. And I do believe we will always have all of that so long as we are in 3D. I'm very interested in where we go collectively once we have alchemically transformed beyond our need for those dualistic practices. But there's certainly, I think, lots of work still to be done. <laughs> oh, I'd say there's a lot of work to be done. So uh, last question. You said most of us are afraid of death. So you're, you're admitting that there's a small population that has some insight that is no longer afraid of death. Is that true? I believe so. I, certainly my experience of, for example, families that have been raised in the Buddhist tradition our, the understanding that we live many lives is just so inherent to everything about their faith that, of course, they're going to see this very differently than families who may believe that that's it. You know, that was it, one life, and we're done. It is, isn't it? It's just, it's so depressing. Mm-hmm. I knew a young man who worked as a, he would pick up, he worked for a funeral parlor, and he would pick up bodies from recently deceased Uh, people in their homes and he said the contrast in what he witnessed in the different faiths was extraordinary and he said it was really really a marked difference with individuals such as as buddhists but but i would also say that so for example i've had the honor of 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 being a death doula i would say a, a few times just being called to circumstances where i assisted a soul in transitioning and for me in that there all fear left all fear left in those experiences. It was nothing but beauty and nothing but absolute trust. And I I believe that is available to all of us. We don't need to be deep, deep students of any one spiritual tradition. We're we're simply asked to surrender to the, the, the knowledge and the support that's there waiting for us at any time. And when we know that, when we know that we are held, as my friend said, when we know we are seen, then what is there to fear? We're simply we're returning home. I'm going to stop right there because there's no way I can ever top that. Adi, thanks so much for joining us today. Excellent, excellent information. How can our, our listeners find you online? Oh, it's my pleasure, Johnny. And my website is worldwithoutfear.org. That's the easiest way to find me. I'm also on, on Substack. You can find my writings there. That's adikanda.substack.com. Excellent. I will put that in the show notes and the transcript as well. You've been listening to Closer to Venus. I'm Johnny Burke. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider subscribing. For more info, please go to closertovenus.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.